welcome along to the Motorhome Matt podcast. I am the stupid one, Keith Gooden, and here's the clever one. Motorhome Matt. Uh, That's not very fair. Well, let's face it, people tune in to hear your expertise and my stupid question. <laughs> no, I just meant that it's not very fair calling me the clever one, the super one. I'm up to oh, call. I see. I'm with you. <laughs> and you might see that today we're in matching shirts. Well, Matt, really? Matt's expecting the debt collectors. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> I bought my new. You went to the charity shop for yours, didn't <laughs> <Yeah>. you? <laughs> oh, dear. Uh, OK. <laughs> Shall we dive in? In today's podcast, uh, we're going to be talking about motorhome and caravan security. Uh, a bit more on that later on. But yeah. first of all, let's dive into the news. And it's all brought to you with that leisure shop dot com. Uh, we're talking about your experiences, actually. I suppose it's not really news. It's Matt's experiences, the life of Matt. <laughs> You've had some patchy experience, haven't you? Lots. With, with rescue <laughs> services. Oh, you, I see. You know, breakdown services. Yeah, we did. We broke down recently. We, um, yeah, it's actually quite funny, this. We drove to Harrogate for the Yorkshire Motorhome Show in a van and a motorhome. Uh, and the night before we went, the motorhome wouldn't start. It had been in the workshop for a month, having a repair done to a part of the bed. Uh, and I think it had been stood around because it went flat. So I hooked it up in the morning, went out, five o'clock in the morning, started, no problem. Brilliant, run away. Drove five hours to Harrogate uh, and parked the motorhome, which was now by now full of stuff uh, for the show, uh, for the shop. And uh, we reversed right up to the entrance, blocked the entrance completely so we could unload it. Unloaded. Some hours later, went back to the motorhome, turned the key, tick, 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 nothing. <laughs> Just tick, 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 literally like that. Completely flat battery again. Uh, and so the battery was dead. Uh, it dropped a cell. You know, I know what that means if you've listened to some recent episodes on batteries. And uh, yeah, completely dead. So we had to call the breakdown service out. Um, and uh, they came and got us a new battery, um, which was, uh, yeah, it was a great experience, as you have to say. 180 quid for a new battery, that's a lot of money, isn't it? it yes, it, would normally, it wouldn't be that much if you bought one in a shop, but to be fair, the breakdown service went off and bought the battery and then came back within the hour and fitted it, uh, and off we went. Um, and am I right in thinking you were blocking the entrance and exit to the show? <laughs> <laughs> completely there was going to be no show at this point you couldn't get in the hall because this motor was completely i parked it right up to the door so we could tip the contents of the garage straight in the door straight into our stand but you weren't going to get people past it there's well, five thousand people queuing up to come in were they happy <laughs> over the moon thankfully it was a day before the show opened but we managed to recover it but the big thing was we had a really different experience. So when we phoned the breakdown service, 16 minutes later, the patrolman's on the phone. I'm on my way, 20 minutes away. Sure enough, Mark turned up, and there he was. Big grin, sorted us out. Hour and a half, we were fixed. We'd moved it. Absolutely brilliant. A great experience. I couldn't fault it. Same breakdown service, back home in Bristol. We're driving our little Austin 7 through the middle of Bristol. Sorry, an Austin 7? Yeah, 88 years old. <laughs> yeah. I made a schoolboy error there as well forgot the toolkit drove through the middle of bristol dirty fuel or something caused a fuel issue seven and a half hours we waited in the end i gave up i went off and bought a pair of child scissors from a shop used them as a screwdriver and that with the aid of a back of an earring uh, not mine jude was in the car with me we cleaned the car Bretta, and off we went managed to fix it in fact it was another hour later that the patrolman rang and said i'm on my way to you and I said, well, we've given up. We've, we've actually moved on and uh, we fixed it ourselves. So it was a very different experience. So I was intrigued what your experience had been. If you're listening to this and you've broken down, might be in a motorhome or a caravan, might be your car, what your experience is of breakdown services, because it seems there are different response times based on where you live in the country. Yes. Well, if you're up north with a motorhome, you certainly get the service that uh, you expect. If you live in the southwest in Bristol with an 88-year-old car, I'm sure they were all <laughs> pointing at the screen saying, no, you first. No, 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 no. Look I'll, at this Muppet. I'll leave it for you. Um, then, you know, there you go. Well, but if yeah. you could have fixed it yourself, why didn't you fix it earlier? Because I didn't have any tools. So I, I waited and waited, and all I needed was a screwdriver. And we were in a part of Bristol. It was a Sunday afternoon, late afternoon. Everything was shut. So I walked off a few miles and found a supermarket and bought a pair of children's blunted scissors for £1.80, used them as a screwdriver to undo these brass screws that probably hadn't been undone for 55 years. So I broke the scissors, hurt my finger, and uh, yeah, 
anyway cleaned it and fixed it and off we went so that's why you should always keep those little toolkits you get at christmas in the cracker yeah, yeah the jude was over the moon <laughs> so let's go for a little spin in the car <laughs> Uh, seven hours on the side of the road in the cold so your experience is please and how do people get in touch then man they can yeah just go to motorhomemat.co.uk forward slash ask matt and we will be having some conversations with the breakdown services uh, on their levels of cover and we plan to do a future episode on specifically motorhome and caravan breakdown so we want to try and build some content for that so let us know how your experience has been and if you search through our podcast you'll see uh, an exclusive we got with with uh, Edmund King from the AA. He's the president, isn't he? He is, yeah. Lovely, lovely man. Uh, and we hopefully might be able to speak to Edmund again about the AA and their offering as well. Uh, but in, in that episode, it was quite scary, actually. Not Edmund himself. <laughs> he was fine. It was what Edmund said. Uh, he revealed some truths about smart motorways. If you ever use them, go and listen to it. I, I will never travel in the near side lane of a smart motorway ever again. OK, then, uh, so let's delve in, shall we, to the meat of uh, this uh, podcast today. It's the Motorhome Matt podcast uh, with me, Keith Gooden, and Motorhome Matt, brought to you with thatleisureshop.com. We're talking about motorhome and caravan security. Now, we touched on this, didn't we, last week when we heard somebody who'd stopped in a motorway service station and uh, his wife had interrupted people trying to... Uh, take his caravan away. Yeah, left it, gone for a coffee and a wee and left the caravan hitched on the back of the car and uh, whilst they were gone, the wife heard some noise behind her, looked round and there were two guys trying to unhitch the caravan and nick it, have it away. So what's your advice then for security? Well, check your insurance policy because th this was Jason from Caravan Guard and they do cover a caravan if insured uh, with them uh, if it's hitched on the back of the car um, but it's really important to check the schedule of insurance and what the insurer's requirement is of you and what and se what security you have to have in place that's in a motorway service station uh, what about uh, just normally let's say for instance you get to a campsite uh, or whatever and you go out on your bicycles is the level of security in motorhomes the door locks up to snuff or do you have to retrofit some up stuff up to snuff up to snuff <laughs> what does that mean it means up to the required standard. Up to spec. Yeah. Caravan locks and motorhome locks can be easily punctured with a screwdriver and then twisted. What is it about expensive items? And it's not just caravans and motorhomes. It's other things we buy. Where about the security, the locks on them are tuppence apney. Yeah, rubbish. <laughs> protecting something which is... Thirty thousand pounds. Yeah, that's true. I mean, some it depends on the depends on the motorhome or caravan you bought. Um, some are definitely better than others. And there's a whole aftermarket industry in additional security for motorhomes and caravans, and this is why. But yeah, some of the locks, they're plastic inside. Really easy just to punch with a flat blade screwdriver and twist. It's frightening. And then the lock is, you know, the lock barrel is six pounds to replace. You think, really? Yeah, why don't you just fit a decent lock on it, as you say, in the first place? Yes, yeah, it's, it's slightly odd. Mm, because there is a huge market, isn't there, for nicked motorhomes and caravans which are taken away and uh, all the identifying marks are removed from them and then passed on. Uh, it, it's organised criminals, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's always organised. I actually spoke with Liz and Jason from Caravan Guard whilst we were at the Yorkshire Motorhome Show uh, on this topic about security and really what items should we consider and what impact does it have on our insurability? Yeah, so it is true that uh, thefts have increased, particularly uh, post-COVID. We saw maybe one stolen a month pre-COVID and now it's more like one a week. So there has been a big increase. It's not a, a sort of pandemic or anything like that. You know, there aren't a lot of thefts, but it's on the rise and a thief will take what they see as the easiest option to steal your unit. So in which case... Um, doing all you can, whether that be the storage location or whether that be the security, it's best to protect the, the asset that you've got. Yeah, certainly. And are they being stolen to order or is it just random, do you think? Our experience is it is no longer random. We find the, the people that are stealing, they are very organised. They know what they're after. And if it is stolen to order, they will go with the equipment they need to bypass 
a lot of security that might be on the unit. So doing all you can is very important. And once it's stolen, it may be taken abroad. It could be stripped for parts, um, given a new identity and resold. So if you're buying a new unit, it's, it's so important that you do your research into the history of it, um, especially if you're buying for a, a private sale. And so various things that, that are done with them once they are stolen. But how are they being stolen then? Because the key's got an immobiliser in, which is connected to the ECU, the electronic control unit. You can't start it easily without the key. I know there's been a spate of house break-ins where people have their homes broken into, the keys are taken so it can be driven away. Is that what they're doing or are they, you know, have they got more talent than that? <laughs> you can actually buy a device that helps you steal a motorhome, believe it or not. So the majority of our thefts are um, stolen without keys. Um, what a, a thief will do is they will have... Hang on, hang on. should we be telling our listeners this? <laughs> uh, well, it's not to scaremonger, but it, it's an interesting fact that, you know, a lot of people, they keep the keys in a safe, somewhere really safe, and they don't need to get into your house now the majority of the time to steal the unit. They will gain entry to the motorhome or camper van, and they will access the the what they call the onboard diagnostic port, the OBD port, and from that they have a way of replicating um, your key and making the the van think that um, you have the key on you, and so they can start it and they can drive it away. So that can be done within a very short space of time for people who know what they're doing, obviously, and. Yeah, they, they wake up in the morning and you, your camper van is gone and you think, oh, I've still got the keys. And are there hot spots in the country where this is happening, so where motorhome theft is more common than others? There are, yes. It's one of the things we, we never say to someone, you, know, you may live in a high-risk area, but you probably live in a very nice area. But what they will do is the thieves will target where they believe them to be and they'll drive around, and whether that be in a storage yard or whether it be at your home address and they will, um, yeah, they'll target them. Main areas perhaps around the um, the motorway network. So, you know, if we were talking about the north of England across the M62, down the M1, the M6, um, around the southeast, places like that. So if you're in a more rural location, we generally find it is a lower risk. But if you, you are near the motorway network, it's easy for them to get away. So it can be a high risk area. And are Fiat Ducatos or Ford Transits more common? Obviously, they're the mainstay of motorhome chassis. And, and by Ducato, I include Peugeot and Citroën as well. Global Telemetrics led a press release out last week where they stated that the Fiat Ducato was more prone to theft than the Transit. Is that right? We do find that, but then again, probably about over 60% of our motorhomes and campgrounds that we insure are on the Fiat base. So by default, you are going to find that more get stolen. We had um, a, a problem a few years ago with a certain model of transit that got stolen more often. But these days, if the thieves know what they're doing, they could steal you know, pretty much any, anything if they want it. The Fiat's are are more common we we do find that definitely less so the vws for example for whatever reason we we get very few of those stolen but it, it can change really quickly the thieves could decide uh, one minute they like a, a certain type of, of motorhome and there's a demand for that motorhome to sell on or to break whatever they do and another time then it might well shift to um, to a different base vehicle and any thief is very interested in getting rid of it quickly, aren't they? And for the maximum amount of money. Now, you were giving me an insight earlier about that kind of thresholds of values which are most commonplace to be stolen. Tell me more. So we tend to find our experience is between about thirty and £60,000 as a market value tend to be the more common ones to be stolen because a couple of reasons really they will likely blend in so if you have a, a row of motorhomes around that sort of value then they can be more easily sold on um, they're not going to stand out in the crowd if you have a hundred thousand pound a class for example it will be more difficult to sell that on whereas what they are selling on are, are the ones that are yeah easy to do so like like anything the lowest common denominator of what they can actually um, move on quickly yeah. Now we're sat here at the Harrogate show in a fifth wheel, we're in a Celtic Rambler, it's very nice I have to say, and Dave thank you for letting us come in and, and make ourselves comfy in here for this little conversation. I guess something like this, a fifth wheel goes onto a hitch on the back of a pickup, um, so it's a huge trailer, it's more like an articulated trailer isn't it for those that are listening that don't know. I guess something like this is probably less 
common to be stolen. Exactly, and and for the same reason. If you see one of these on a campsite, it, it gets a lot of interest and it's very difficult to, to sell on. Um, the, the guys at Fifth Wheel, they, they know their owners, they know who buys them, they've got you know, the, the chassis numbers of them all, etc. So, yeah, and like I say, if you have something that's quite unique in terms of a motor or camper van, then it's probably less likely to be stolen because it can't be um, sold on without someone actually realising that, that it's something quite unique. So it would be great to talk about what we can do to stop this happening, and we'll come to that in a moment. So stay tuned. But Jason, tell me, are motorhomes being stolen more so from storage sites or from people's driveways? Which is more common? So again, our experience is probably around two thirds of customers keep their motorhome or camper van at home and the remainers put it in some sort of storage. So if we look at storage first, there are obviously recognised sites out there, Kosoa, um, Gold, Silver, Platinum and um, the Bronze, which is recently recently changed they're great you have the accreditation and so in fact you know what you're getting if you put it on a Kosoa site because they have to comply with certain conditions that doesn't mean to say if you choose a different story site that it's not going to be up to standard um, what I would say and I recently changed my storage site for my caravan I phoned them up and I went and I looked around I looked around the whole site I looked at the security consider things like if there's a break in the the hedging or the fencing can it be taken across fields so that happens quite a lot in a theft are the gates always locked um, does the does the owner live on site does it have cctv if it does does it always work don't make assumptions ask a sorry site owner what security do they have in place and if any of it for whatever reason stops working to notify you and um, because that that can happen yeah of course we have a storage site of our own and we've got battery backups on all of our systems so uh, if the cameras fail we get an alert because they text us to say there's been a power cut and we get 48 hours I think before you know there's a problem and the power fails completely so our CCTV keeps on working and that, that is really important isn't it and if someone changes their storage location you need to know don't you as the insurer that's right it's a condition of our insurance if you change your storage location we, we do need to be informed as soon as you do that if, again for your own protection really if you move it from secure storage to uh, maybe on the on the road outside your house for some reason or a, a lesser secure storage area then we may not accept that as a storage location and should the worst happen there's, there's a chance you wouldn't be covered and obviously no one wants that so give us a call straight away or whoever you you may be insured with let them know any changes to your circumstances let them know so that in the event of a claim you're going to ensure that you're fully covered what about though if i'm taking a motorhome to a motorhome dealer for some repairs and it's going to be there for a month do you need to know then no we automatically cover um, the unit when it's with um, in for repairs or servicing or anything like that we we cover it automatically at a recognized dealership Thanks, Jason. That's great. So, Liz, we're going to come to you. I want to ask you a little bit about what people can do and the benefits they have as an insurer from your perspective of different types of security measures. If I'm putting it on my drive, what do you advise people to do to try and prevent a theft? Well, as Jason said, it's about fitting as much security as possible. So there are a range of devices out there. One practical tip, though, is to park in any drive is to actually park the motorhome in nose first um, so that then that can avoid it being, you know, towed, pulled off your drive, you know, from, from the front of the motorhome. But then it's fitting things like um, steering wheel locks, physical security devices, which I know might seem a bit strange, but um, it's anything that can really slow a thief down or might just make them think twice you know and, and maybe move on so things like you know that are very visible and physical uh, steering wheel locks um, wheel clamps we also know of owners who will turn around the uh, driver cab seat and then um, face it into the habitation area and lock that with a padlock or a chain um, there are things like pedal locks or clutch claws there are locks for your gear stick um, there are also things like removable steering wheels um, so the, there are a range of products out there and what we would say is that you always look for a sold secure standard product um, you know so there's like different ratings there for gold and they've been tested for their resistance to attack um, so we would always you know recommend those sold secure products and sold secure is a label isn't it that gets stamped on the product or on the box to show you that it's insurance recognized 
they tend to be um, gold automotive for um, motorhome products. For some um, wheel clamps, they might be caravan rated as well. So, you know, look, look for those sold secure markings on the, on the products. Then there's a, a range of electronic um, security devices. So um, most motorhomes will obviously come with an immobiliser. Um, but then you can get um, Cat1 alarm and also then tracking devices. Um, so we would always go for Thatcham approved tracking devices. You've got S7 and S5. S5 is the better product because they're proactive tracking devices and they come with things like ID tags um, so that, you know, if they have bypassed the keys or you know they've not got the keys and um, there are some now uh, tracking devices now that um, you know you need like an ID tag and um, which might be in the form of a, a fob or it might be um, like a credit card mm. type thing so if it hasn't got that tag in the in the cab then it won't start. You can also disable the starter motor can't you? I mentioned te- Global Telemetrics earlier in their press release they have a product where you can remote disable the starter motor so it, it, even without the key it won't start at all and with the key it won't start. It's really important to look for those you know Thatcham approvals when you, you're picking your tracking devices. For us to ensure motorhomes over a certain value we will um, actually ask for a tracking device and or a cat one alarm and um, so you know when you when you are insuring your motorhome you need to speak to your insurer about what those requirements might be. Now that value's gone up hasn't it so what's the threshold now from Caravan Guard to need a tracker? Any motorhome of £65,000 would need a tracking device, Thatcham approved tracking device. So yeah, that's recognising that obviously motorhomes have gone up in value. Mm. And, and talking about that, um, it's really important that you do set your correct sums insured, um, you know, when you are insuring your motorhome, especially if you are insuring new for old, so that in the event of a theft, you know, that you are covered yeah. for its correct value. Yeah, of course. Now this is, all, this is all good stuff, but it all costs money. Wheel clamps, steering locks bike chains, disc locks to stop my seat being spun around. What's the benefit of having all of this? Am I going to save that cost in my premium? Is it going to make a difference? Yes, the good thing is that we do, because we do reward those security conscious motorhome owners. So if you are going to fit um, the electronic security devices, you can get up to 25% off your premium. Um, and then we've recently introduced some discounts for those physical security products. So you will get a 5% discount for things like the steering wheel locks. We recognise that you know you are going to have that initial outlay of, of um, those security products, but you've got to remember you've spent a lot of money on a motorhome itself. So I think it pays to protect that investment with those, you know, security devices. But we will reward, you know, those security conscious owners with some attractive discounts. Now, many owners will apply all this security when it's parked at home on the drive or in storage. But we're here at the Harrogate Show. Our motorhome is in the camping site here with all the other traders. I will confess, there's I've, all I've done is locked it and we've come to work where we're exhibiting there's no security on it at all where do i stand with insurance in that scenario if it's a requirement of the insurance to have um, a steering wheel lock a tracker whatever it might be then that should be on all the time that it's um, that you're not around the motorhome basically so if you're leaving it then you should apply all the security if it's something that isn't a requirement but you've chosen to fit that security then it doesn't need to be on there you know somewhere like the show for example they couldn't just drive away with it so you know you you, you're in a secure place so nothing should happen here hopefully you won't No, there's no way they're getting it out we're blocked in (laughs) yeah Um, but if we say you need that security then it needs to be on whenever you're not with that motor, whenever it's parked up or, or stored to be on the safe side because it's less often but we do get um, camper vans and, and motorhomes stolen when people have gone into town maybe and had a meal and they come out and, and it's, it's gone. So the important thing, they're really important is you understand that in the schedule of insurance for the insured, what the terms are that are being imposed by the insurer in terms of when you're away from that vehicle, what security has to be on it. That's right, yes. And we, we tell all our customers that what they need to do, whether that be in our help text online or whether it be in our contact centre, we always make sure they are fully aware um, because you know thefts do happen and that's what the insurance is there for to pay out in the event of a theft but you just need to comply with the terms and conditions so no doubt there are some conditions that you might apply to how a motorhome is stored and what security then is fitted to it but Liz we were talking earlier about gates locked gates cctv drop posts and so on are they often a condition that you impose 
They can be, yes, depending on the value of the motorhome and where it has been stored. So at home, you know, I mean, it's always a good idea anyway, again, to have as much security as possible. So, you know, get the best quality gate posts that you can get or these, you know, like you say, the drop-in posts that go, that will sit behind or in front of your motorhome. Also, if you're saying that you're storing your motorhome in front or behind lock gates and they've got to be locked 24-7, um, so, you know, it's not acceptable to to leave them open you know overnight or you know while you're out at work during the day maybe um so you know if you're going to have lock gates and you've got those stipulated on your insurance policy they do need to be locked at all times and and also in storage the batteries can go flat can't they which means the tracker actually stops working especially on a caravan if you do you know, store in your, your motorhome in a, a storage location um you know and it's away from home we would recommend you do check up on it regularly particularly in the winter months because you know batteries don't like winter um you know and you don't want that um, tracking, you know, the battery to go flat. There are some tracking devices now where you've got an app, um, and they will give you an alert when your battery levels yeah. do go low. So there's there's something to consider, you know, when you are choosing your tracking device. It's really important, particularly in the winter months, to check on those battery levels because you know you need to make sure those devices are always working. Same goes for the alarm as well. Absolutely, and tracking devices is a minefield. We have a future episode planned on exactly this and the benefits and merits of each one and why you should consider them. We have had a question. Um, it was from a chap called Ron. We don't know where he was. And I realise I haven't primed you on this, so you might want to take a moment to prepare the answer. But he said, is my motorhome insured if I've left the keys in it and it's stolen? It's the condition of the policy. It's a general condition that you need to take reasonable steps to look after your property. And what we would say is, if you leave your keys in the motorhome and it's unattended and it gets stolen, then that isn't something that unfortunately we would cover. Uh, and we, we have found that some people say, well, I keep a spare key in the motorhome. Again, you know, we wouldn't recommend that at all because someone could break in and be, you know, just perhaps looking at stealing some things in the motorhome, they find the spare key and then steal the, the whole unit. So, no, if, if you're leaving the motorhome, even if you're at a petrol station, you know, or whatever it might be. I was going to say, what if I'm just going to pay for my fuel? And I've forgotten, I've just left the keys on the seat or in the ignition. If, it's t- if someone jumps in and drives off, that's it, I'm not insured. Unfortunately, yes, it'd be the same for any car insurance policy. If you go to fill up at the petrol station, you go in and pay, you, you take the key with you, you, yeah. lock the, you lock the unit, just looking after your, your property. People need to be very vigilant, don't they, and be very mindful of what they're doing and how they're looking after the asset. That's the key, isn't it? Yeah, we've spoken quite a lot about you know units getting stolen and how they're stolen, they don't even need the keys, but we don't want to scaremonger. It is still a very small minority of motorhomes that get stolen but the best you can do to protect your motorhome or camper van and have that security on it to pay a bit extra for better quality security then you're really minimizing the chance of anything happening to it. Well some great advice in there and some top tips as well things I hadn't considered like parking nose in on your driveway at home makes it much harder to nick. Yeah I've got a, I've got a neighbour about four or five doors down from me he's got a big motorhome it really is very impressive and he's had his drive resurfaced last year and the motorhome suddenly appeared and uh, he, he puts a, a wheel lock on all four wheels and four wheels yeah and then and then he parks a car in, in front of it so clearly he's worried about losing it to somebody where do you live <laughs> you're in a crime hotspot <laughs> i didn't think so four wheel clamps and a parked car blimey <laughs> That's going for it. I bet his insurer gives him a discount. <laughs> but I thought Liz's advice about parking nose into the house, you know, and a steering wheel on full lock, it's brilliant. Really easy things to do to help prevent the theft of your motorhome. Uh, yeah. And the question is, of course, if you do upgrade the security, say the, the, the locks are, or, or whatever, does that usually attract a discount from insurers? As they say, yes, often it will. I mean, these things all cost money, don't they? Um, and it will attract a discount. It makes you more insurable. That's the first thing, because, you know, if you've got an £80,000 or even, as Jason was saying, a £40,000 motorhome, so within the thresholds of the most commonly stolen, you know, if you've got no security on it, the insurance company may not have an appetite to insure you at all. Um, or you might, they might give you a, you know, a very extortionate premium, thousands of pounds. So they fitting security reduces the premium undoubtedly um, yes it has a cost but it's about protecting your asset isn't it and keeping hold of it I mean you bought it to enjoy so you know don't resent buying the security it has to be part of the considered purchase and the budgeting that you need to do
Yeah, because it's non-stop hassle if something gets uh, stolen and all the paperwork and then waiting and yeah. then replacing. Jason was saying there, wasn't he, that we mustn't scare people. No. But, I mean, what else costs that much money that you leave outside? Well, yes, quite, exactly. And and it's a big investment. And, you know, to leave it un- unattended um, and not looked after and not secured it would be daft. Jason came up with some great advice. In a previous episode, we were talking to them um, about insurance uh, of course, and he was saying about keeping the receipts for all the stuff you buy that goes inside. What a great idea! You know, they will Caravan Guard will offer a cover for the stuff and the content that you put in the motorhome. So, you know, if when you buy the motorhome, it's empty. You then go off and buy tables, chairs, hookup cable, you know, and all these accessories that go on it. You know, solar panels, lithium battery, perhaps. It all has a significant cost. And this is all insured, but you have to provide the evidence that you bought it. So keeping the receipts. I mean, how often do we go out and buy stuff and we just bin the receipt, don't mm. we? But actually keeping it, maybe taking a photo of it, building a file and just saving it, if in the event something's stolen, all that stuff potentially is, is insured. So I thought that was a top tip. Good tip. So that's uh, uh, the latest gen for your motorhome and caravan security. Of course, if you've got any other questions, then you should get in touch with the Motorhome Mat podcast. How should people do that? Easily. Just go to motorhomemat.co.uk forward slash ask Matt. Hit the orange button and record your question. Tell us where you are in the country. We love to know. Or you can fill in a form if you'd rather not hear your own voice on the podcast and you can submit it that way there as well. It's the Motorhome Matt podcast. I'm Keith Gooden. And I'm Motorhome Matt. And we're delving now into our audience Q&A brought to you with that leisure shop. Dot com. David is in Kent. He says, hi, I'm on the verge of buying my first motorhome slash van for full time living with my wife. Do you think a seven and a half metre motorhome with good living space and an island bed would be more stressful than a camper van, which can be parked easy, more easily for wild camping, as we don't intend to use campsites very often? Thanks, says David. Well, advice. We I'm assuming the stress is going to come from the worry of parking it and where he's going to put it. Um, I mean, potentially, no. If you're in a big open space with the landowner's permission where you're going to park up, check out our episode on Trespass, uh, then you know, you're know you going to have plenty of room. Manoeuvring it is going to be harder for sure. But I'll tell you what David should do. Go and check out Darren the Urban Motorhome. He's just taken delivery of a tag axle, probably eight metre long almost motorhome, and he lives in it full time. Uh, and he's parking up in all sorts of places, often in urban areas, neighbourhoods. Uh, and, and I would go and check out Darren and see, follow him, see his journey. Niels in Swansea, listening to your podcast on the different types of motorhomes, you highlighted a number of anxieties regarding electric vehicles. I've lived with one for the last two to three years, he says, and he loves it. I'm going to a motor show with a view to purchasing a motor caravan and can't wait. It is too early for EVs to be efficient in these areas, but there's a significant investment in items such as solid-state batteries, which would increase capacity, charge time and reduce weight. Looking to keep my current vehicle until we get to ranges of 450-plus miles. Great channel, by the way, 450-plus miles. I mean, even with the good stuff that you've seen at the shows recently, that's a stretch, isn't it? That's a long way, yeah. Thank you for your message, Neil. You're right, there's... This is a huge topic. We are going to be delving into this. We've kind of lifted the lid on it, the, the topic around electric motorhomes and camper vans, and it's a real mixed bag. Um, we spoke at length to uh, Gary from Camper Van Co at the NEC show in February, and they were launching a 100% electric camper van. Uh, absolutely brilliant product. Uh, and that the, the key threshold for them was 200 mile range and then they went live with it and they've been researching and and creating hybrid and now all electric camper vans for years for quite some time so they're definitely one to watch i think the issue though starts with commercial vehicles Uh, and until we get vans that have a reasonable range then you know then come motorhomes and that's a year or three after we've got vans the problem and I'll lift the lid on it now. We we have mentioned this before. The government ruling is by 2030, all vehicles sold new 
are a minimum of hybrid. So be able to go a certain distance on no fossil fuel, which is deemed to and accepted to be about 80 miles, I'm told. And then in 2035, all new sold vehicles must be zero fossil fuel. They must be 100% electric. And electric is the route we're kind of being guided down. I use that word very carefully, but that's the route we're being steered toward by our government is all electric. So as a result, the van manufacturers are thinking, well, what's the point of making a hybrid van? It, we're only going to be able to sell it for five years, and so they're not. So all the investment is into electric vans. The e-sprinter has been launched and last year managed to do a fairly significant trip of hundreds of miles on a single charge. That's a great sign. Uh, but what payload did it have? I don't know. I mean, I'm still waiting to find out some more detail. So this is a massive topic. And we we, we interviewed Edmund King, the president of the AA, uh, as we mentioned earlier. And we talked with him about electric motorhomes and his view. I mean, they're still in a pickle about what they're going to run their own fleet of recovery vehicles on. You know, is it electric? Is it hydrogen? Uh, is it synthetic fuel? And they don't know. And so there are so many questions. There's so few answers, I think, um, on this topic. And of course, the other side of this is the infrastructure. You know, how do you go and get charge? Um, lots of people having challenges with recharging their electric car. I don't know what your experience has been, Neil. Um, but it's a massive topic. And yeah, I think the ability to travel in an electric motorhome any great distance feels to me like it's a, a deadline beyond 2030. Yeah, 2035, you said it's, everything's got to be all electric. Anything so, Sold new. Everything new. So, of course, the great impact for this if you're a diesel motorhome owner, what's it going to happen? What's going to happen to the value? It's going to go up. Because mm. you can't buy a new one at that point. You know, and, and at the moment, it's hard to buy a new one because of supply chain issues. So we, And used values have shot up. Well, I think that's going to happen again. Right. Uh, and of course, a lot can happen in 12 years, because that's what we're talking about. But we have to think about uh, not only have uh, the bigger batteries got to be invented, they've got to be mass produced, and then they've got to be designed into vehicles. 12 years isn't a long time at all, is it? Not really. No. And then there's the infrastructure side of it as well. So we've got conversations lined up and some happening with a number of EV experts. And it really is you know, a, a niche within the motor trade, I have to say, uh, and there are some big players in the market who've got some real insights and we're having conversations with them and hoping to get them on the podcast. And also people like National Grid. So they're a big part of this development and the future of this. But, you know, that's all well and good. But what about a campsite on the peripherals of the UK? How do they have a, How do they offer electric charging? The Sun ran a story, proper clickbait story, classic Sun, that staycationers are warned campsites may not be able to host them this summer. And the real story was campsite goers with an electric car and caravan and the campsite can't offer a car recharge facility. There's no recharge point and therefore they can't go to that campsite. So it was a bit of a tenuous link really from the sun. But it's true, most campsites don't have the electric capability to offer a, charge re a car recharging service. Um, so we're talking to campsites about this as well because this is going to have a big impact on campsites and how they supply and charge for electric. So big topic. So thanks for raising it, Neil. Yeah, thanks, Neil in Swansea and David in Kent. Thanks very much. How do people get in touch then, Matt? Very easily. Just head to the website motorhomemat.co.uk forward slash ask Matt where you can ask a question, you can record it. Please tell us where you are. We'd love to know that. Or you can submit it via a form. On the website, you'll also find where to find us on Facebook and Instagram. And we're on YouTube as well as Motorhome Matt. Whilst you're there, make sure you click subscribe and hit the bell. And if you are listening on Apple or Spotify, please, would you leave us a review? A five-star one would be lovely. It really helps populate the world with the podcast and spread the word and makes Keith and I really, really fuzzy. 